I want to say something about my next trip to Texas by way of introduction. I'm going to go to Austin sometime around the presidential inauguration, sometime in late January 2013, uh, for a conference. I don't have the working title. Conference sponsored by UT Law School. And it's going to have to de deal with issues of constitutional stress, or perhaps we could say constitutional failure. It's going to be a fairly critical event. It's going to look at a number of aspects of the American Constitution uh, that we have a right as citizens to be concerned about or to be worried about. I'm looking at a lot of issues where we really have genuine cause to wonder how well our constitutional system is actually functioning. And whether you're a Democrat or Republican, whether you come from the left or the right, whatever your position is ideologically, anyone who reads the newspaper seriously has to share those kinds of, uh, those kinds of concerns. I think it's worth mentioning this because I think when one teaches the Constitution, as the teachers who are the core of the audience uh, here today do, uh, it's important on the one hand to understand what an impressive achievement it was, and I'm going to say something about that in the rest of my remarks, but I think it's also important to remember it is a document that we're entitled to teach like any other document. As important as it is to our history, to our culture, to our politics, it's something we should also be able to think about critically. And not to think about it critically would in some ways be a betrayal of what the revolution itself was about. And I'll try to explain that uh, as we go along, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm saving some time for questions afterwards. So these are things, these are things we can pursue as we go on. So the title of my lecture is How Americans Invented Their Constitution. I could say straight off, that's a question one can answer in any of a number of ways. Um, we can talk about the Constitution as a whole, which is what I intend to do, but there's any of a number of provisions within the Constitution where we understand that what Americans did in the late 18th century was actually quite innovative. And if we want to talk about how they invented their Constitution, we'd like to talk about all the changes in political and constitutional thinking that took place in the decade before 1787 that made the actual content of the Constitution possible. But I want to stick to a kind of more, well, I'll say a more general or a broader topic. When I say how Americans invented their Constitution, what I really mean to talk about is how they invented our concept of a Constitution. When Americans talk about the Constitution, and when the revolutionaries talked about it in the, late 17, in the 1770s and the late 1780s, they were giving that word, which was familiar from ancient political thinking, they are giving that word and that concept a new and much more specific and a much more precise meaning. What I really want to use this, this evening's lecture to explain is where did that meaning come from? When Americans talked about a Constitution, as they, as they thought about that concept, in the decade that essentially begins with independence in 1776, how did their idea of a constitution change? So let's start by saying, uh, yeah, let's start by giving the conclusion, <laughs> by saying, when Americans speak about a constitution now, uh, and when we talk about constitutions, and we talk about it all the time, I spend a lot of time with law professors that were, you know, kind of studying constitutional law as kind of the, the temple of legal learning. A uh, number of historians, not as many as there should be, a number of historians like myself still work on the subject. When we talk about a constitution, what it is, what is it that we are talking about? So the basic American defi definition goes something like this. A constitution is supreme, fundamental, written law. It defines everything that a government can do in its name. To attain that status, to be a constitution in the full American sense of the term, it, a constitution has to have been adopted at a specific moment of historical time under fairly exceptional conditions. Uh, in the American case, to adopt a constitution means by 1787, 1788, when the federal constitution was adopted, a constitution should be drafted or written by a body appointed for that purpose alone. It should be a body that's not going to exercise any power later. It can't really be a legislative uh, body, and I'll come back and talk about this uh, in, in, in a few minutes. And then, uh, you know, so it should be a collection of fairly eminent, distinguished, qualified individuals and so on. Um, but it's not sufficient that you bring a bunch of smart people together and ask them to deliberate seriously about what a constitution is. To make a constitution supreme fundamental law, you need to do something else. The something else that Americans came up with in 1787, 1788 was to say that that constitution had to be submitted to the American people, uh, acting in some kind of collective capacity. What they did then was to, in every state but Rhode Island, uh, was, to, was to ask the state legislatures uh, to approve the calling of ratification conventions, especially, especially elected uh, groups of delegates who would come from every community, typically Americans enlarged who was allowed to vote for those conventions. Those conventions in turn would be able to debate the Constitution, then decide in, a, in effect in a straight up or down vote whether or not that Constitution should be accepted or rejected. 
I'm going to come back at the very end of my lecture to say what I think was really, really neat and really quite ingenious about what the Americans did. But so here we have a set of basic conditions. A constitution is a document. It has to be written, obviously, uh, at some specific moment in historic time. Uh, it has to be adopted by a special set of procedures, preferably a convention acting for that purpose alone, then ratified through some more or less direct expression of the wishes of the people. And then once it's adopted on those terms, it can, it, can, it can operate as supreme fundamental law, which means there is no higher source of law within the polity. Uh, it is the highest source of law we know. Uh, and everything the government or governments will do thereafter has to be made consistent with constitutional values and constitutional practices, constitutional principles, and constitutional procedures. Uh, and that's a new definition. The word constitution, of course, was an ancient word. There are equivalents going back to the writings of Aristotle, uh, you know, back in the middle of the, you know, the, the first millennium BCE, uh, you know, discussing constitutions. Uh, his notion had been picked up by other writers in antiquity and in the medieval period. For them, a constitution, in, in effect, was, uh, was a descriptive term. Uh, every state, every society has some kind of constitution. Every society has some way of making decisions of government. They might be absolutist. They might have some aspects of representation or, and so on and so on. You can think of any of a number of variations. Maybe the aristocracy has some say as well. But the idea of a constitution then was essentially it's a way of describing how government operates. It doesn't have that, that, that high quality or that distinct quality that I just described to the American understanding. It doesn't require a written document. It doesn't require a special set of procedures doesn't even make any assumptions about supreme fundamental law. Every regime has a constitution, and if you want to study politics uh, and you want to do it comparatively, you would go out and describe what those constitutions look like. Just a descriptive term. That's what, that's what the Americans moved away from in the decade after independence. And the story I want to tell this evening, essentially, is a way of trying to explain how that story unfolded and how within the space of you know, a decade, give or take, decade and a half, depending on exactly how you want to date it, the Americans produced a new definition, which has been our basic norm of governance ever since. That's the problem I want to try to wrestle with. And I'm going to do this being a historian, meaning I can only think in terms of telling a story chronologically. I'm going to do this essentially by trying to cover pretty quickly uh, a kind of succession of phases and try to show you how the American concept evolved and how it ended uh, in 1787, 88. Well, I won't say ended, how it culminated in 1787, 1788 with the ideas that we still continue to study. OK, so that's, that's my agenda. Now, here comes the real meat. Pay attention. We're going we're to cover a lot of points here. Um, and then I'll open this up for questions. And if I confuse you on something, you're welcome to ask me to, to, to deconfuse you later on. So let's say we wanted to ask the question, as historians like to do, where did this idea of a constitution begin? How did it, this new idea of a constitution, from what did it emanate? Well, one possibility might be the Americans before independence, before the American Revolution, already had some examples, some precedents for what having a written constitution might look like. And those precedents are fairly obvious. Most American colonies had been founded either as royal colonies or proprietary colonies with some grant of legal authority from the, from the British crown. Uh, and uh, you know, most colonies had what we call the charters. Of course, Americans always think about the Mayflower Compact 1619 being kind of the first and most formed of these. Um, but we could go back to the, you know, the grant of corporate privileges to the Virginia Company before it settles Jamestown, the grant, of, the grant of a corporate charter to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the late 1620s, and so on and so on. So there were a number of charters for individual colonies. Sometimes they were, adopted, they were accompanied by legislative acts, uh, let's say passed by early sessions of the colonial legislatures, which would enumerate some list of rights and privileges that the inhabitants, the subjects, the residents, all those colonies ought to have. Uh, Americans, in the course of their history, in the kind of amid, in, amid the contentions of colonial politics, often appeal to those, to those charters. They did that particularly in the decade after 1765, in the decade after the Stamp Act, when Americans get embroiled in a constitutional controversy with Great Britain. So we might say there's one, one possible example here, at least one antecedent for the new American understanding begins with the colonial charters. And that's not a bad argument. It means Americans are somewhat habituated to the idea that you should have some written source of authority that will somehow define what you know, the basic institutions of government and perhaps the rights of, of subjects and citizens should look like. There's one basic problem with this, though, is that those, char those particularly the charters, 
were not, they weren't really acts of consent. They didn't involve the local societies actually deliberating on uh, and you know, formulating their notions and actively assenting to what those charters would be. Essentially, those charters were grants of privileges given either by the Crown or by proprietors, places like Maryland and Pennsylvania, which, have, which, are, kind of, which are actually owned by particular families, the Penn family and the Calvert family. Uh, so they, they're not full, really fully constitutional in our sense of the term. Uh, they could be revoked. The king could move to revoke those charters, as he sometimes did in the 17th century, under what are called in quo warranto, and under, under whose authority and, and under which warrant do you hold this claim? Perhaps parliament could have a say in altering or revoking those charters, as they tried to do with Massachusetts in 1774, right after the Boston Tea Party. So the charters represent an example of what a written form of government might look like, um, but it's not really entrenched in the way that the American conception of a constitution would come to be after 1776. So there might be a place to begin, but it's not going to carry us very far in the argument. The real story, I think, really begins after the Boston Tea Party, really begins with the crisis of independence that erupts in the American colonies in 1774. Now, particularly for the teachers present, because you, I mean, to pick up on the little story Priscilla you know, related about me earlier, you guys should really know this stuff. <laughs> and if we don't know it tonight, we should go over it tomorrow. But the critical thing to know is that after the Boston Tea Party was in, after the Boston Tea Party takes place in December 1773, the British Parliament responded to that by passing uh, the raft of measures we call it the Coercive Acts or the Intolerable Acts, which essentially punished both Boston and Massachusetts. Uh, and that in turn provoked the political, the, the political crisis in the next two years, which ended with the American decision for independence. That's why the Boston Tea for those of you who bought, uh, you know, you should all rush out and do this, of course. Those of you who bought a copy of my book, Revolutionaries, that's why I decided to begin my narrative history of the revolution with the Boston Tea Party as a critical event and then the consequences that come out of this. So it's, it's that set of events, what the, what the Bostonians did by dumping the tea in the harbor, harbor, how the British government and parliament reacted to it. That was the real basis for the crisis of independence for the two years of agitation, which effectively began in, in the late spring and actually in the mid-spring of 1774 and culminated in the late spring, early summer of 1776 with the American decision for independence. Now, we don't have to go through the politics of independence, but what we do have to note are some features of what went on at that time. So when Americans move into a kind of proto-revolutionary situation, when, when resistance seems to be leading them uh, towards independence uh, in the two years after, two, two and a half years after the Boston Tea Party, um, if, we looked, if, we, if, we, if we had a map of the 13 American colonies, it doesn't work equally well in each colony, but it works pretty well for the colonies as a whole. The first thing we'd observe is legal government has effectively collapsed. Uh, it's effectively collapsed because key parts of legal government represent either the British Crown or the proprietors, who, you know, like the Penn family or the Calvers, who are in effect acting for the Crown. They can't collaborate in acts of resistance that look like revolution. Um, uh, judges holding officials, ju judges holding their commissions with grants, you know, grants of under, grant, under, under the authority of the Crown can't really operate courts um, legis if legislatures try to meet and they try to organize resistance in most, not every case, but in most cases they'll be dissolved, prorogued or dissolved by, you know, by the colonial gover governors. In effect, legal government you know, survives somewhat marginally in some counties, but in most places it's really replaced by what I like to call a revolutionary apparatus of committees, uh, conventions, and congresses. The different terms that Americans use to describe the extra legal sources of authority that operate in the colonies. These bodies were terrifically effective. Most observers, including a number of loyalists who try to, look, try to make sense of what's going on, look at these bodies and they say uh, they have at least as much respect, arguably more, than uh, the institutions that operated in normal times. The whole community pretty much was mobilized to support the cause of resistance. Uh, and these committees are just terrifically effective. And if you want to criticize them, which you, you want to be very careful, it's very difficult to be a loyalist in America in 1774, 1775, 1776. If you do, you'll be in a lot of trouble. Uh, you know, 500 people will show up in your front yard and suggest you might want to change your opinion. They'll make you, to use the old American saying, they'll make you an offer you don't want to refuse uh, under those circumstances. So you have this terrifically effective uh, emergence of a new set of institutions. Fits a revolutionary situation perfectly. 
the, the phrase that historians like to use is they're not illegal, they're extra legal. They're terrifically, uh, they're terrifically effective. They really represent a consensus within most communities. They have the, the force of the community behind them. It's very hard to oppose them. It's very risky to oppose them. Uh, so they're, they're terrifically effective and they mobilize Americans for resistance and eventually for war. But there's some things they can't do. They can't act legally. They can't operate courts. And courts, in many ways, you know, literally what happens in, in, in your county court uh, or your, your monthly court sessions or whatever, what, J, what JPs, what justices of the peace do, what higher levels of judges and juries do, that's the real essence of what most government was like in the American, in, you know, in 18th century America. Courts can't operate in this environment. You can't do things legally because a whole set of legal rights operate, which, you know, these kinds of bodies can't really deal with very effectively. So the curious thing that happens is from 1774 to 1776, as Americans move closer and closer to independence, the desire to restore legal government uh, in the full and proper sense of the term becomes part of the political equation as the Americans move towards independence. And when they start discussing independence actively in, you know, late in the winter, you know, early in the winter of 1775, 1776, on into the spring after Tom Paine published Common Sense, when they start discussing independence actively, one of the things they agree very quickly is that a decision for independence has to be accompanied by a decision to restore legal government. And that's, that's the kind of precipitant of what, you know, that's the first kind of significant point of departure for what happens with the American case. So what starts to unfold in the, in the you know, very late winter, spring of 1776, is individual colonies ask the Continental Congress, you know, the, the, most ex, the highest and most extra legal body of all, they ask Congress for permission to restore legal government. But you can't just restore it in the sense you can't just take the old government and recreate it. Because after all, the old government represented in significant part the crown. You can't simply replace the crown. You have to think of how you set up an executive that's going to be somewhat different from the crown. And it could be since you're conducting a revolution, which the Americans were, you might have some new ideas about what that government should look like. Right? There, might, there might be some new concepts out there that will define what you want your government to look like. Uh, and that, that'll be some of the other particulars we could have talked about, you know, how, how Americans invented their constitution. I'll say something more about this for the teachers tomorrow. I won't say much more about it now. The key thing is that after 17, say, for Americans are living in a condition that they recognized from having read John Locke in particular as what they called a dissolution of government. Uh, and it's the absence of effective law. It's not the political weakness of institutions. It's the, act, it's the absence of effective law. It starts making Americans very nervous. So in the, you know, in 1776, in the weeks and months preceding independence, Congress, you know, in a set of resolutions, first individually and then collectively, grants authority to the American colonies to restore legal government. What that means is at this point, what they have to do is they have to start writing constitutions. It's a sense it's an accident. In a sense, it's a byproduct. It's kind of a circumstantial result of the situation in which they found themselves. Typically what happens is the provincial conventions, which are in effect kind of surrogate legislatures that were meeting in virtually all the colonies, typically they'll have a fresh election. It will be understood that the delegates going to the next session will have some kind of authority from the people to engage in constitutional discussions. There's some kind of what social scientists call some kind of ex ante, some kind of prior authorization for them to do what they're supposed to do. Uh, and they will, you know, and they'll, they'll carry us out. So if we look at state by state, I have to go to Virginia on the weekend, and so this is, this, you know, this is on my mind. Virginia is kind of the best known, but most studied example of this, but by no means the only one. Typically what this means is the convention will meet, it will appoint a committee uh, to start drafting a constitution. The committee will look at a few really noteworthy guys in Virginia. It happens to be George Mason, uh, the owner of Gunston Hall, which is a, a great house not too far from Mount Vernon. Uh, to, you know, they'll, you know, they'll appoint a handful of people who seem really kind of qualified, probably well-educated, to do the actual work. They'll discuss the Constitution, and they'll put it into effect. Um, this is really where, I think, for most historians like myself who've looked at this process over the last few decades, it's really understanding the nature of what was going on at the state level or within the colonies that were becoming states in 1776. It's really understanding how the dynamics of writing constitutions worked at the state level that we really begin to see how this new American conception of what a constitution is emerged. Uh, so it's a process that begins in the, in the individual colonies. And it gets a 
fair amount of attention. People write about it. John Adams writes his famous pamphlet, Thoughts on Government, uh, in April 1776. It actually be, Adams' pamphlet actually began as a letter to his colleagues in uh, the Continental Congress who'd asked his advice. They just recognized he was a smart guy who'd read a lot and they wanted to know what his opinions were. If you know anything about Adams, you know he had more opinions than he, had, than he lived long enough to share with the rest of the world. But Adams had thought pretty long and hard about these issues. So he, you know, he first kind of writes these out as kind of a draft memo for his colleagues, and then he expands it into a pamphlet. He ends the pamphlet with, uh, you know, with a wonderful statement. I don't know if Priscilla will remember my saying this in class or not, because I always would recite it. But he ends, he ends this pamphlet with what I think is one of the most remarkable statements any American, uh, particularly in that period, said. He says, you and I, my friend, have been sent into life at a time when the greatest lawgivers of antiquity would have wished to have lived. When before the present day polka, the present age, had three million people full field and a fair opportunity to form the wisest and best governments uh, that the human mind can imagine. I, it's pretty close. I, I missed a few words there, but that's 95% right, or maybe even higher, uh, as to what Adams actually said. And it captures the remarkable sense of opportunity that people like Adams, Thomas Jefferson would also fit this quite well. Um, you know, one of the curious things about Jefferson is Jefferson, you know, we remember Jefferson first and foremost, for writing the Declaration of Independence, obviously. Um, the curious thing about Jefferson is Jefferson wanted to be back in Williamsburg, which was his college town. He actually, he actually suggests that Virginia should call its delegates to Congress back so they could participate in the process of writing the, state con the, the, the new constitutions. He's a little upset that he's stuck in Philadelphia writing the Declaration, which will only be the source of his eternal fate. He really wants to be able to go back home, and he spends some time drafting his own idea of a Virginia Constitution, which he sends to his friends, uh, his friends back there. So Jefferson, John Adams, others like them, they, feel this, they did feel this great sense of historical novelty, of opportunity. They were taking something that Europeans had speculated about, but only in the you know, most general and vague terms, and now they're actually trying to actuate it. They're, they're, they're trying to come up with a basic method for saying what a Constitution is. So we had this great experiment about what some of, at least some of the revolutionaries were deeply conscious of the historical novelty and the possibility of what they were doing. People like Mason and Adams and Jefferson, even if he's stuck in Philadelphia, eating cheesesteak sandwiches uh, and the like. I don't know, they're probably not served in, you know, down in this neck of the woods, probably. I don't know, so I say cheese. I went to school outside Philadelphia, so I, I know about the origins of the cheesesteak. Anyhow, so that's, that's where the story begins. Now, but here's a catch. Were these constitutions truly constitutional in the full sense of the term that Americans were going, about to develop? That is to say, were these first constitutions supreme fundamental law, effectively regulating, determining, providing a set of criteria against which you could judge or assess other acts of government? Some Americans thought they should be. I mean, some Americans already had the idea that a constitution should be a statement of supreme law. There's one really interesting pamphlet, which may have been written by Tom, Thomas Paine. There's, can't resolve this, it's possible, hard to prove. Uh, but a pamphlet called Four Letters on Interesting Subjects, which gives a good example that says, you know, talks about the British Constitution, then it says, the British don't really have a constitution. And the reason they don't have a constitution is Parliament can always change it. Uh, it gives a famous, there's a famous example, and if you go back to 1715, some of, you remember, some of you may remember that the, the Stuart monarchy finally ends, or the last of the Stuarts being William and Mary and then Mary's sister, Queen Anne. The last of the, last of the Stuarts on, on the daughter's side reign, and uh, Queen Anne dies in 714. She's replaced by the first King George, who was from you know, the German electorate of, of Hanover. At that time, when British politics was very disrupted, a parliament that was had been elected for three years under a triennial act decides it's not safe to sit for three years only. It passes a septennial act saying, we're going to sit for seven. You know, and that's perfectly constitutional in Britain because Parliament is the supreme source of law. Um, but that demonstrates that kind of, you know, that's, it's perfectly, you know, it's because it's legal, it becomes constitutional. But it shows how different the British understanding of the Constitution was. That, you know, that wouldn't work very well in our case. The key thing here, though, is if we go back to 1776, it turns out there's a big problem on the American side. And that problem goes something like this. So this is a bit of technical history that I think you have to appreciate to understand what the American story was like. So the conventions that met, uh, that wrote the first eight constitutions, as I said, they were authorized to do that. They, I mean, many of them had, there's some kind of general sense by the voters 
that the delegates they're sending off would have the responsibility of constitution writing. So there is some kind of prior authorization for writing constitutions. Just wait a second to get the answer. But, and it's a big but, those conventions could not be constitutional bodies alone. Why? Because the Americans were fighting a war. And those conventions had lots of other business. They had to do a whole host of the ordinary business of government. They were surrogate legislatures, uh, extra legal but effectively operating as legislatures. Now, why does this matter? Well, because if you're acting as a legislature, whether it's a, a full legislature or let's say a surrogate legislature, by definition, the nature of your acts has to be legislative in nature. And here you come up against a kind of basic problem. Uh, if a constitution is framed by a legislature and the legislature's authority is sufficient to say this is what, you know, this, uh, this, is, you know, this is all the constitution needs to be enacted, then it means that constitution is essentially legislative, or we could say statutory in nature. Now at this point, to get into the technical part, there's actually a famous Latin phrase I'd like to use here. And I usually say, in an audience like this kind, I know it doesn't need any translation. But, which is a joke, actually. So, so you know, so the, the phrase goes, le, quote, leges posteriores priores contrarios abrogant. Priscilla, you remember what that means, right? <laughs> well, it's an, it's an old phrase. I think it's in both canon law and common law. It means, literally, you know, I, I did Latin high school. I'm a little rusty on it, but I've studied this a lot, so take my word for it. It means um, later laws contradicting earlier laws abrogate them. Legis posteriores, later laws, contra uh, priori contrarias, contradicting earlier laws, abrogat, abrogate them. Now, this, uh, this is a very legalistic notion, so let me describe what's going on here. One legislature cannot bind another. Anything that the Texas legislature passes this year can be undone by a future Texas, Texas legislature. Anything the Congress of the United States should ever manage to do anything again, which is an open question, uh, but one day it'll do something. Anything Congress passes can be undone by a future Congress, right? People start to think about that, and they understand this is a problem. So the, we have constitutions. The Americans had to, you know, the Americans, in effect, are inventing the idea of a written constitution. To restore a legal government, you have to do some positive, concrete act to say what the government's going to look like. But can that constitution have the kind of deep, entrenched, permanent authority that the definition towards which the Americans were going to move uh, were in the process of creating. And the short answer is no. It can't because those bodies were essentially legislative in nature. So they, you could call the Constitution a Constitution, but that wouldn't make it one in the full sense of the term. Now, what's interesting about this, uh, we'll have to have a little, bit more, a little more part of the story here. Um, this, uh, the recognition that these constitutions, in that sense, somehow defective or imperfect or hadn't attained a full measure of constitutionality begins to dawn in American political writing in the years after 1776. And the way it dawns is, is quite interesting. The first, in some ways, the best name of this actually comes from the citizens of Concord, Massachusetts, which, of course, we'll remember is you know, one of the two towns where the Revolutionary War began back in April 1775. Um, and when the Massachusetts General Court, the, I'll say more about this in a second, tried to, you know, tried, uh, tried to propose a constitution, Conquer and a handful of other towns say, you can't do it because if a legislature drafts a constitution, a future legislature can alter that and that will leave us, the citizens, without adequate protection for our rights. I like to think this is kind of a bottom-up expression, you know, ordinary citizens. Maybe there's some Harvard grad who was helping them to think about this, the local minister or whatever. You know, they say you can always tell a Harvard man, but you can't tell him much. So maybe, you know, maybe that, maybe that, was, maybe that was part of the story. But I think it's just, you know, it's kind of a almost like a populist understanding from it. And then on the other hand, if you ever read Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, and you look at, which was written in the early 1780s, and you look at how Jefferson discusses the Virginia Constitution that he had wanted to draft but couldn't because he stuck writing the Declaration, Jefferson says the same thing. He says, you know, we can call this a Constitution, but Constitution is synonymous with ordinance or statute. It's, you know, the word by itself will not give you the status you want. So the criticism begins to arise that um, these, you know, that what we've done, was, they're certainly written constitutions. I mean, they, they meet part of the criteria. There are documents written through some process of collective deliberation with some initial 
political participation by the people, at least author, you know, kind of latently authorizing it. But they can't, they can't be more than, legisla legis than legislative uh, texts, the equivalent of statutes in their nature. An ordinary citizens in Concord, a sophisticated thinker like Jefferson, who really was a sophisticated thinker, understand that there's something problematic or something that seems to be incomplete in this process. Now what happens here, I think, is, is a two-stage process. And part of it plays out in Massachusetts, part of it plays out with the adoption of the federal constitution. I want to say something about how the story works itself out, and I'll make a couple of concluding remarks. Then we can open this up for questions, and even, you know, and comments, and even if you want, some criticisms, because I can take it. So, so what happens here, so we have to tell the story of Massachusetts, um, which is a funny place to live. I've lived there for six years. Don't ever drive there. If you ever visit, just take a cab, and, you know, be safer, and so on, particularly if you're in Boston. Massachusetts is a special case, and what happens there is quite interesting. Um, so Massachusetts, back in, let's go back to 1774. So after the Boston Tea Party, Parliament passes the Coercive Acts, punishing Boston and Massachusetts, as close as the Port of Boston. That's the first act, the Boston Port Act. Second act is the Massachusetts Government Act, which alters the char alters, alters the second charter which Massachusetts had received from the king, uh, king, William, the th uh, king, king William as in William and Mary back in the 1690s. Uh, it tries to create an appointive council. Didn't work. The, what the Massachusetts guys do is if you were appointed to be one of the governor's counselors, all your neighbors will show up and suggest you resign the office. So those guys can't really act very effectively. Um, so royal government was paralyzed in Massachusetts. There's a provincial convention. Uh, but Massachusetts, of course, is the hotbed of where things are going on. It's where you know, there's an American army, a British army, uh, in the early months of 1775. Uh, actually down to March 1776. So it's a very, you know, the, you know, the whole locus of conflict. Ma Massachusetts is really is mobilizing hard. It really wants to have legal authority restored. So they petition the Continental Congress. And the Congress says you can resume legal government under the second charter, the one that goes back to the 1690s from William and Mary, um, with, the, with the council that the lower house of assembly will elect acting as a government don't worry about the details. I just want you know. I just being a story. I have to get them out, and then we'll we'll move beyond them. So Massachusetts restores a kind of legal government, but it's a kind of truncated version of the old royal charter. People say, no, we want a proper government. So the Massachusetts General Court, the legislature, uh, drafts the Constitution, in 1776, that sends it out to the towns. In Massachusetts, people meet in their town meetings so they can discuss public affairs. And some of the towns, again, Concord, the one I mentioned, say. Well, I'd like to quote Bard on this. Nish, nish. You can't do this. It's not proper. Uh, again, you're a legislature. If you adopt it, it would be subject to your revision later. And other people don't like the Constitution on the merits. So it doesn't work. They try it again in 1778. The General Court tries to write another Constitution. The legislature tries to write another Constitution. That doesn't work either. Now more towns protest. And then finally, what happens is they decide they have, they have to do something different. So at this point, 1779, they agreed they will elect a special convention charged with the task of writing a constitution. And that convention will have to give that constitution to the towns, meeting of their town meetings, sent out to the people, meeting of their town meetings, to ratify, to approve. So you have those two basic conditions, a special convention to propose and the town ratification approved. What happens here is actually kind of funny. I can't resist this. So John Adams. I have mixed feelings about John Adams. I'm much more of a James Madison guy. Um, Adams comes back from his first trip to France. And, uh, you know, he's been absent from Abigail for some time. That itself is a really interesting story. So, but he's elected going to the, he's elected to the Constitutional Convention. And the convention forms, a, the convention, which is like 400 some delegates, appoints a committee of about 30, 36 delegates. They appoint a subcommittee of three. It's John, Samuel Adams, John Adams, somebody else. The other two guys say to John Adams, you do it. You know, you write it. I mean, it shows how this kind of collective deliberation breaks down. So Adams writes it, at least he writes most of it, then he's called to go back to France. Uh, so he leaves the Constitution behind. The, the convention resumes, it had to resume quite late because the winter of 1780 was one of the worst winters in like half a century. The snows were terrible, so convention meets late. But eventually it finishes the draft 
It sends the draft out to the towns. It says, you vote on it, you approve it. It doesn't tell the towns how they're supposed to do it. You know, they, they, they didn't have like a little checklist saying, you know, we approve or we reject. The towns had to kind of figure out on their own what they were doing, and the result was actually kind of a complete mess because there wasn't one, there wasn't one kind of simple checkoff box to say it's approved or rejected. You get this real melange of responses, which are kind of here, there, and everywhere. The convention comes back together, it looks, it looks at the responses, what we call the returns from the towns. It says, well, looks like it's been approved. You know, they do the best they can to make sense of it. So, you know, it's a, it's a new process, right? So they haven't worked all the details. The key thing is, though, they have the core concepts. You know, you, get, you solve their problem of a legislature being able to, to revise something. You know, if a legislature drafts it, then it's subject to revision by a later legislature, so it can't really be constitutional. And you come up with an effective theory, at least a general theory, that the people should be given some opportunity to assent to the Constitution. They can't figure out procedurally exactly how to make that work. So the funny part of the story is the kind of range of returns you get. But the core concepts are there. It's a major step forward. It's a real, it's, you know, even, and even if John Adams has to do most of the work, you know, I delegate, you delegate, and so on and so on. Uh, even if, you know, there's a kind of funny story behind how the thing's actually written, even so, the process itself looks quite interesting. That's what Madison, the guy I like to call my alter ego, was building on in 1786-1787 as he starts to put together his strategy for the federal constitution. Now, the story of the federal constitution was, I'm sure you guys know this, but just, you know, the, the basic facts, the Article of Confederation, the first federal constitution had been drafted by the Congress in 1776-77, sent out to the states. It takes a while for them to ratify. Maryland holds out for particular reasons. Articles aren't ratified until 1781. At that point, Congress knows enough is deficient in the articles. It starts trying to get amendments adopted. The problem with the amendments is they all have to be approved by all 13 state legislatures. They never get that approval. So that's why we get the Annapolis Conference in 1786, and then the which you know not enough guys show up to make it work, but they don't want to they don't want to adjourn empty-handed. So they say, we had a lot of fun here. Let's have another more general convention meet in Philadelphia in May 1787. But the question there remains, you know, under the Articles, you would you know any any constitutional change requires in theory requires um, approval by nine states. Uh, in the kind of Congress by all 13 state legislatures, which any sensible person, and Madison was certainly one, says this is a formula for political impasse. We'll never get anywhere with that kind of rule. So when the framers get together, the fact that Rhode Island, so they like to say Rhode Island dropped off the American continent, who would notice its absence? You know, it's this tiny bit of rock that's kind of attached to New England. So, you know, it's, its role in American history is mostly negative, but it plays a critical role. Rhode Island refuses to go to the convention. If it's not going to go to the convention, what's the chances that it's going to approve anything the convention does? That's a great act. What Rhode Island did, though, was a great act because, in effect, it's saying you have no chance of succeeding if you go the usual way. You need to come up with some alternative strategy for how you're going to make the Constitution work. So that's what Madison, in particular, the framers in general, worked on. So their, their proposal was, A, okay, they were already a special convention. It's a body not known in the Articles of Confederation. They will only exist once to discuss, you know, to discuss and frame a constitution. The question is, how will you ratify it? And here I think they had a real stroke of genius. Part of the genius, the part we're familiar with, is they say, A, we're not going to send it back to the state legislatures. The state legislatures will be net losers. If we create a strong national government, who's going to lose authority? State legislatures. So that would be a problematic political move to make. And B, we're not going to be stuck with unanimity. Why should we let Rhode Island or Delaware, you know, the two smallest states, uh, or Maryland or, you know, New Jersey, uh, you, know, the less, you know, the less populous states, or Georgia, why should we let them, you know, unilaterally block constitutional change? So we're going to move away from unanimity. I like nine. You know, America's already playing some version of baseball uh, by this time, I don't think nine had any magic number yet, you know, had any significance. Of course, the American League, they played ten, but, you know, I always thought that was an abomination. So we move away, we move away from 13, we'll accept nine as the basis for doing it. That's the stuff I think we already know um, is worth talking about. What I think is even better, though, what I think is really the key part of this, though, uh, is how the framers solved the question of ratification. This, in effect, going back to that Massachusetts situation, so the framers say, here's how we're going to do it. 
The state legislatures have to agree. They, legally, they have to consent to call conventions. You know, you can't elect a convention within a state. The state legislature has not made the election legally possible. So the legislatures have to sign on. But the conventions are going to, are, are going to be the actual decision-making bodies, right? Well, that's phase number one. Phase number two, when the conventions meet, what can they do? Now, here you get into a really interesting situation. If the conventions are there representing popular sovereignty, the conventions are as close as you can get to assembling the sovereign voice of the people in its full power. That's a potentially dangerous idea. Who's to say where a convention can stop? Right? If it's really there representing a sovereign people, the we the people the Constitution invokes, in theory, it can do whatever it wants. That makes the framers a little bit nervous. And perhaps they have the Massachusetts example as well. So they come up with what I think is a really clever idea. And it sounds a little bit strategic, it sounds a little bit manipulative, but I think it works very well. What the framers say is that the, the state ratification conventions can speak, they can speak with a really loud and deep voice because they represent a sovereign people. But when they speak, they can only say one of two words. They can say yes, or they can say no. They have to act on the Constitution in total, in its entirety. They can't adopt Article I, but say we have some qualms about Article II. If, they want to, if, if, they want to, if you want to think about amendments, the conventions can propose amendments. But they can't make the approval of the Constitution contingent, you know, legally contingent, upon the adoption of the amendments. Right? So you come up with this remarkable way of expressing popular sovereignty directly. Uh, in a way that I think in, winds up being pretty unambiguous in its final result. But it's carefully constrained in a really striking way. A sovereign people can vote, but it can only say one of two words. It can say yes or no. If it wants to say some other things, they don't have First Amendment rights yet because the First Amendment hasn't been written, but you know, they have rights of political speech. So they can propose as many amendments as they want. You can't make the decision contingent upon the amendments. So that's, I think, this is the basis, and this is, in a sense, this is the basis, or this is the theoretical foundation for the supremacy clause of the Constitution. It's what makes the Constitution says, this Constitution, laws made in pursuance thereof, and treaties made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. That's the statement. The basis for making the supremacy clause supreme is this process of you know, deliberation by special convention, ratification by popular conventions, which, however, cannot tinker with the text. Now, when you think about this problem, and you understand the, and I spent a lot of time thinking about this the last 20 years or so, um, and I, I come away from it, you know, the more I think about it, the more impressed I am by what they did. If you look at the kind of, look at the mess the Europeans are in now with the EU, or what they were in uh, 10 years ago when they tried to revise the, when they tried to adopt the European Constitutional Treaty and made a pretty bad mess of that as well. If you, if you start with the proposition that the framers had no real examples for what they were doing, Go back to John Adams' sense. We've been sent into life at a time when the greatest lawgivers of antiquity would have wished to have lived. You look at the experimental basis of what's going on in the states, you know, the opportunities taken, but then people realize their problems. You look how Madison and his colleagues come along, and they rethink what had been going on in the states, and they try to really take, you know, serious lessons away from that experience. Then they come up with what I think is a really brilliant solution, a special convention, you know, with no less than Washington and Franklin there, a lot of smart people like Madison and Hamilton and Governor Morris and James Wilson and others hanging out. So, you know, a real nucleus of smart guys to do the discussion. And then this really ingenious method of ratification, which means however, however bitterly Americans disputed the Constitution, and some of the, some of the debates were quite bitter and are filled with, you know, the same kind of craziness we see in a lot of our political rhetoric today. Even so, in the end, when the process was over and everyone agreed, even Rhode Island, uh, that the process had been a fair process, that it had been done in a way that was genuinely respectful of the sovereignty of the people, and really represented a significant step forward in how you think about what, you know, what the nature of a constitution should be. So that's my basic story. Now, I have a very short conclusion about this that I want you guys to think about, then we'll open this up for questions. I, I hope I'm okay on time or without, okay. So I don't, I don't need to get the hook yet. So let's go back to my next visit to Texas. I mean. I happen to think, if I could be John Adams as the lawgiver, there are lots of things I would change tomorrow morning. First thing I'd do is I would, I would get rid of the equal state vote in the Senate. Texans should agree with Californians on this. 
So I'd ask, you know, if I like, as I like to ask my students, why does Wyoming have two votes in the Senate? You know, and California has two. You know, the Senate is a silly, to be honest, a, the idea of an equal state vote is a, is a terrible idea. It's reflecting the Electoral College. I get rid of the Electoral College tomorrow, and we'd actually have a national popular election. One person, one vote, no matter where you vote. You know, no st cut the states out of entirely, just have a national popular vote. That's what I do on day two. On day three, I think we start thinking about what kinds of terms should Supreme Court justices have. You know, 15 years. I mean, give them decent time in office. 15 years, 18 years, 20 years, whatever. But they shouldn't be able to determine when they can retire in order to cook the results of the appointment process. That strikes me as a nutty idea as well. So there are lots of things I would change about the Constitution. But here's where I see what I think is the genuine dilemma of American constitutionalism, which I like to put in this way. To me, when I study this, and I spent, it, having turned 65 yesterday, I can now say I've spent a number of decades thinking about this. You know, so I had my birthday. I was really eager to get to Texas because I haven't been this this far south before, so I couldn't say no to this opportunity. You know, it seems to me, you know, this is a, it's a really remarkable process. Uh, what happened here? I mean, the whole experience of the American Revolution, the process of constitution making, it seems to me, is a great tribute to the whole idea of applying man's reason to reform political events. I mean, it's kind of the fulfillment of what the 18th century Enlightenment was supposed to have been about. Uh, so that's one point. On the other hand, and then I look at the I look at our current constitution and say, God, what a mess! You know, what a mess of a situation we have. I could also talk about the the 60 vote rule in the Senate. I got rid of that on. First, I abolished the Senate, but then I also got rid of the 60 vote rule, whether I abolished the Senate or not, and so on. Um, and yet, on the other hand, when we think about how we proceed with constitutional change, it seems to me the great irony and the great dilemma that this experience has left us is we have no confidence in our capacity to undertake anything like the process that those guys pioneered, in the expectation that human wisdom could build from one generation to the next upon its antecedents. We're deeply nervous about, I mean, if we actually discussed the Constitution, we would worry a lot more about all the adverse things that might happen than about the potential benefits we might gain. And so there's a real dilemma there for which I have, just being a historian, I have no answer. Um, I can't solve that. But I do have one comment on this that comes from my alter ego, James Madison. It's a, kind of, it's a famous passage from uh, Federalist 49 where Madison was warning against, this is the part of the Federalist where Madison is talking about uh, the separation of powers. And he, he takes the unusual step of he spends a couple essays discussing a proposal that Jefferson had made that nobody else had taken seriously, which was to deal with constitutional problems by, by proposing to have conventions of the people elected to resolve constitutional disputes. Madison says he thinks this is a, you know interesting idea in theory, but really a terrible, it's likely to be a terrible idea in practice. Here's the key passage he says. He asks Americans, in effect, to go back and let's rethink the nature of forming, the whole process of forming constitutions. Madison says, notwithstanding the success which has attended the revisions of our established forms of government, and which does so much honor to the virtue and intelligence of the people of America, it must be confessed the, that the experiments are of too ticklish a nature to be unnecessarily multiplied. And then he says, let's think back to 1776. He said, we are to recollect that all the existing constitutions, being the constitutions at the state level, were formed in the midst of a danger which repressed the passions most unfriendly to order and conquer, of an enthusiastic confidence of the people and their patriotic leaders, which stifled the ordinary diversity of opinions on great national questions, of a universal ardor for new and opposite forms produced by a universal resentment and indignation against the ancient government, meaning the imperial government of Great Britain, and whilst no spirit of party connected with the changes to be made or the abuses to be reformed could mingle its leaven in the operation, the future situations in which we must expect to be usually placed do not present any equivalent security against the danger which is apprehended. You followed what I said, Madison said, let's think back to what happened in 1776. In fact, we had lots of favorable circumstances that would make it possible for us to write constitutions. You know, we were united. You know, we really detested the foreign remote of government. We had confidence in our patriotic leaders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In the future, we're not going to have those advantages. So Jefferson's idea, it'd be a good idea of periodic conventions. Madison, you know, as much as Jeff Madison admired Jefferson, thought of him as his closest friend in politics, 
he also thought that's a really dangerous idea. This is where it seems to be Madison embodies this remarkable conference in the capacity of our reason to think through problems of the kind he had thought through and a deep concern about what future generations might or might not be able to do. That's the real dilemma of American constitutionalism. We should have a high degree of confidence in the rationality that went into the formation of institutions and we should have a deep degree of anxiety as to whether we could do any better. And I don't say this out of slavish loyalty to the founders. It's not that I put them up on a pedestal and say they're better than the rest of us. It's that situationally, there's a really difficult set of circumstances we have to confront. So that's my answer. At least that's one way to think about where our idea of the Constitution comes from. There are lots of other ways to talk about this in terms of particular clauses and provisions, but I hope I've given you something to think about in, you know, in this light. And thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah.